Returning to the question of what is LB1, what are these remains from Flores, recall that there are a couple of possibilities. One argument that's been put forward is that LB1 represents a pathological individual, perhaps one coming from a small stature population to begin with, not unlike the populations that exist on Flores today. In this case, LB1 would be a microcephalic individual, an individual who, for some pathological reason, has a small endocranial volume. Because the brain size of LB1 is too small to be explained entirely by having a small body size. It's much smaller than you'd expect, even if you shrunk a human down to have a small body size. So there's been additional sort of de-evolution of the encephalization that we talk about throughout the Pleistocene. So in order to test this hypothesis, people have compared the morphology of LB1 to that of microcephalic specimens found in museum collections. The challenge is that lots of different conditions cause microcephaly. And so there's no uniform morphology associated with microcephalic skulls, aside from the fact that they have small brains. There's a few other challenges with this hypothesis as well. One is that we have additional remains, although not as well preserved from Flores, that suggests that the LB1 individual is not necessarily exceptional. At the very least, we have other mandibular remains that are very, very similar to what we saw in the mandible of LB1. So if it's one individual who's pathological, that's maybe okay. But if suddenly we have two individuals who are both pathological, that becomes a much harder hypothesis to support. One in which we think the argument for parsimony would go that this is simply not pathology, but rather the normal condition that we see. The second prominent argument that's been put forward is that LB1 is a different species. Some late existing, offshoot, dead end species in the Homo lineage. Something we might refer to as Homo floresiensis. There are a couple different models we could use to explain the evolution of a very late existing Homo species, one separate from modern humans. Because again, recall, modern humans are already present in this region. They might have existed on the island of Flores at the same time that LB1 did. We even have stone tools coming from the Lingbo cave, which are almost most definitely made by modern humans, perhaps coming from the same time period. Stone tools that include microlithic and bone tool elements that we are sure had to be made by modern humans. In order to explain how LB1 may have come to be a different species, it's important to point out that morphological studies of the LB1 crania most commonly point to an association in terms of overall morphological similarity to very early homo specimens. Specimens, for example, like the D2700 individual from Dimenisi. Now, D2700 is actually larger in size than LB1, but there are a lot of similarities between the two specimens, including a relatively lightly built superorbital torus, one that extends seamlessly into a fairly low sloping forehead, a fairly gracile face including zygomatics that come down low on the maxilla, and an overall small globular vault, again similar to early Homo habilis. And again there's similarities even in the dentition of these specimens, which again hints at perhaps some degree of an affinity. Now why would a specimen 20,000 years of age look like a specimen 1.75 million years of age? One explanation or one possibility is to recall that Dimenisi represents the beginning of a dispersal of hominins outside of Africa. One of the earliest places that we find specimens after Dimenisi is in fact Southeast Asia. Specimens from the island of Java, such as Trinil, Mojo Kerto, early Sandron remains, suggest that hominins were present in Southeast Asia by at least 1.4 million years of age. Although the island of Flores sits beyond the Wallace line, beyond a point where it'd be easy to reach, it's possible that hominins at some point during the Homo erectus evolution got isolated and ended up on Flores. If that's the case, they may have really truly been isolated. Isolated to a degree that no other hominin population in the Pleistocene was. And isolated on an island. So that the processes that led to Homo floresiensis becoming a different species were ones associated with very strong, stable isolation, coupled perhaps with insular dwarfism. So the similarities to Homo habilis might reflect real evolutionary connections between an expanding Homo erectus population that became isolated, coupled with the reduced size that was associated with insular dwarfism. What Flores represents in this case is perhaps how difficult it is to actually create a different species of Homo late in the Pleistocene. Unlike Neanderthals, for example, Flores may have really had true isolation. Not just partial isolation, where it was a separate population for thousands of years at a time that episodically reconnected with other populations, but a population that was really, truly isolated. Perhaps as much as 800,000 years of isolation. 
Michael Morewood, the archaeologist who helped excavate the Lingboa remains, suggests that there are stone tools on the island, Ashelian stone tools, that go back maybe 800,000 years. In other words, the population that eventually led to the Lingbua remains may go back on the island of Flores all the way to the end of the Lower Pleistocene. So it may have been isolated for 800,000 years or more. And the primitive features in this case, including for example those extremely primitive features of the wrist bone, might suggest extreme degrees of selection to a very local environment, in complete isolation from pre-existing populations elsewhere. By the time modern humans moved across this area at the end of the Pleistocene, by the time they began to populate Australasia some 40 to 70,000 years ago, Lingbua may have truly been an extraordinarily different species, with some degree of retained familiarity in terms of the overall cranial structures, but very different in terms of its morphology, behavior, diet, and behavioral capacities. It really is not necessarily a story of the main thrust of human evolution. It's a side branch and an interestingly odd side branch no matter what it is, but it might be an example of what true speciation in the Pleistocene actually looks like, and how it differs from these processes of population differentiation that we observed in the Neanderthals and other archaic populations. So hopefully more excavations will be done at Lingbua, hopefully we'll see more remains, and be able to clearly and finally put an end to this argument as to whether or not this is a diseased individual, or whether or not it represents a truly extraordinary late Pleistocene sister species to ours.